Okay, this is going to be a little bit different here. We're just going to have a quick look into why people in the 1980s took the micro or computers to such a degree that it was almost mania. And I don't mean that in a bad way. It was, it was more than a fad and it was more than an interest. And I just want to f look into the reasons why this happened because um, didn't seem to happen for any other item for that extended a period. You see, what seems to have happened is, is that built leading up to the 19, late 1970s, early 1980s, there were movies with computers in and movies with robots and all the kind of electrical gadgetry that we kind of take for granted now. Um, you know, phones, mobile phones, Star Trek with its flip kind of communicator, which we ended up having flip phones and all this kind of thing. But we had an almost 15 to 20 year block of the computer being virtually king. And it's kind of changed our outlook on things as well. It's changed most of our lives in the way we do things. Even if you're not an avid computer user or you don't even have one in your home, you've got one in your pocket. You use one when you go to book your holiday. You use one in stores like Testos, Tesco's where they have their self-scanning tills and so on. So everywhere you go, there's a computer. There's a computer at your bus stop controlling when your next bus is coming along or your train station and so on. That really didn't happen before the so-called computer revolution took off. Now, it would be nice to figure out so, why it happened that way. Processing system. It's a kit to make your own computer at home. Whatever for. There were quotes around the late 1970s and early 80s saying, why would anybody need a computer in the home? There wasn't a need for it really, was there? I mean, we had games consoles. They could have just evolved into better games consoles, such as the Xboxes that we have now or the Playstations we have now. That you could see happening. But to be able to take a machine with nothing on it such as the early micros, which didn't have anything. They had basic and that was about it. You'd switch it on, you'd get a ready prompt. And that was it. Didn't do anything. It just sat there blinking at you, waiting for you to tell it to do something. And maybe that was the thing. Maybe it was the fact that we could tell a machine to do something. I mean, computers were big, scary things in the eyes of movies and science fiction. But when you got a micro home and you found it was not much bigger than an A4 piece of paper, they became less and less scary. And I think people started using them. Marvelous. Let's see what she can do because they were no longer frightened of them. They wanted to see what they could do. I think that was the biggest thing. What can it do? At the moment, nothing, but we'll make it do something. And that was the psychology behind it, I think, is that we could finally make something do what we wanted it to do. Previous to that, there's not a lot out there that you could actually make do things the way you wanted it to happen. So if you wanted to put a, a dancing man on the screen, you could do that. You could spend hours in basic putting a little ASCII or pet ASCII graphics on there to make a rudimentary dancing man. And um, it would do things. It would do whatever you made it do. You could then make it do your home finances or catalog your video collection. Or what a lot of people did is have their own sort of home recipes if they're interested in food and cooking on there. You know, there were basic, very basic, very simple things that we take for granted now. You know, you Google everything, don't you? Or you ask 
Alexa or Siri and it comes back at you. And we take all this for granted. It's kind of the norm, isn't it? But the norm developed over the last 30 to 40 years. We didn't have home computers. We didn't have PCs. We didn't have business computers, really, unless you're talking about the big IBM machines at the time. And minis and mainframes, you wouldn't have one of those in your house. You'd probably switch it on and it would blow the whole power supply for your neighborhood. They were that power intense and that big. So there was a load of cottage industries that sprung up as well about my, uh, microcomputing. People started writing software and then thinking, you know what, people might use this. So they ended up giving it away or selling it to people. And that spawned a whole new industry. But what was the psychological thing basically behind people wanting a home computer that they couldn't do much with. Now Clive Sinclair hit the nail on the head really with price. Sinclair understands what the man in the street wants. Simplicity, affordability, elegance, elegance above all. The next computer has to do everything theirs does and more. And it has to be half the price of theirs. We start taking orders now. You price something low enough, regardless of its specification and what it could or couldn't do, and people will garner an interest. And once people garner an interest in something, it mushrooms, it explodes, it expands. And that's what he did. The government got behind the computer industry as well, and then they chose to promote it. They didn't have a platform in mind, but they promoted computers and computer industry. It sort of spooled into this all-encompassing electronics and computer sort of arena, which was great because when they came out, the, the world wasn't the same place as it was now. The UK was in recession, there was a mass unemployment, you know, the, it took the mind away from what was actually going on in the world. And I think that was a good thing. And also, because of the interest it garnered throughout the 1980s as well, it now, it produced a lot of the programmers that we take for granted now. A lot of the software that we use now was because of that. And bedroom coders, as we now know them as, were just bedroom computer users and later geeks and so on, they're the ones that slowly and gradually changed the world. They wrote business software, game software, utilities. And um, we've kind of, we kind of stepped away from the bedroom coder into a more professional run organizations writing software. But Towards the later years, or the latter years rather, we've gone back to bedroom codings, making apps, apps for mobile phones, which are essentially pocket computers. It's gone full circle and it's a good thing because we have more variety now. Because you had the variety with the original computer users, then it went to a point where it was the big organizations that took over and now it's back to more variety with software not costing hundreds and thousands of pounds it costs pennies now which is where it all started from you could buy a game for a couple of pound then games got to 50 70 and 100 pounds which were starting to alienate a lot of their users and now it's gone back to you can get a game for a few pound or even free I mean, if you think the um, the playground etiquette now over games consoles is is rife and is prevalent in schools and etc., but it's nothing compared to the early 1980s when people stuck their colours basically to a mark or a make. It was basically Commodore 64s, Sinclair Spectrum, ZX 81s, Oric ones, um, Dragon 32s. And people would stick their colours to the mast and that was it. They would fight tooth and nail to 
let you know that they had the best platform you could do more with it and so on and so forth so it was a little bit tribal as well and that's gone by the by a little to a certain extent that sort of thing's kind of gone by the by and it did for a while and um, I think there was a big influx of computer users through basically throughout most of the 80s. Um, at Sinclair Computing we've recently uh, developed a truly groundbreaking machine, uh, the Quantum Leap. And just recently we received our biggest ever order for our latest product, the Electron. And into the fairly early 90s with the, the arrival of the 16-bit machines but then it started to disappear when people especially with the 8-bit machines realized that they kind of dabbled in it they've done as much as they could with it and um, they found out there's not really a massive use for them in the home from next week the Sinclair QL now priced at just under 400 pounds is to be reduced by 50% and although Sinclair originally promoted this machine as being capable of more serious applications, it failed to make any inroads into the business computer market. To make matters worse, the boom in schools buying computers has also passed, and it was demand from schools which helped catapult Acon from being a two-man outfit to a turnover of £93 million. And so for 1985, the most serious computer game of all is being played by the companies themselves. I mean the the Ataris and the Commodore six uh, and the Commodore Amigas and the STs and that trundled on a little bit longer and the Amiga was quite a fantastic machine for its era and its time and the ST to be honest wasn't that much far behind it but it wasn't until the internet came along and the usage of the World Wide Web was when they really started to take off again, but they went in a completely different direction. They were no longer machines for learning how to program, how to code, for opening your eyes towards computers and what they could do and the potential they had. It was more of a, a gateway to somebody else's server to grab information. And that's basically what they've become. They've become more of information machines than learning machines and I think that's the biggest thing we no longer want to learn how to code we no, no longer want to learn how to make these machines do anything not on mass anyway and not in the the numbers and the volume there was when these machines first came out we no longer want to tinker with the electronic side of it most computers now are closed architecture they don't have an edge, edge connector as such or direct access to the processor they're basically closed systems you know do you have it for a few years you think it's getting a bit slow you chuck it away you get another one you know there's um they're more of a consumable item now but we've become users now which is you know the the old tron movies where everyone was a user we've become that we're no longer programmers and innovators we're users but I wonder what the 10 year old boy who first got into computers would think now would he enjoy the the freedom we have with the internet yeah we've become users and I wonder what that 11 year old boy is going to think is he going to think we've let everyone down or is he going to go wow this is star trek now i think the wow this is star trek bit would be your mobile phone because a desktop pc is still a, a computer with a monitor and a screen and you know mice came in in the late 80s anyway so mice yeah, the mobile phone would be the eye-opener. The desktop PC wouldn't so much because it's more evolution and revolution. Um, I think the standardization of stuff would have rattled them a little bit because 
you got to remember, if you walked into a, a hardware store or computer store back then, you would um, just marvel at the new machines that were coming out. They were always different. There was always something to get excited about or involved about. If you walk around a PC world, you see the monitor, a keyboard, and a usually now a black box, which used to be a beige box. It just changed the colors. And um, there's not a massive amount to get overly excited about because spec for spec, they're very similar. Most of them use Intel chipsets. And there is no, there is no basically no fighting against manufacturers anymore. They, they just promote a machine at a price point. And that's it. We have price points. We don't have revolution. We have price points and have evolution, and that's really the way it's gone. I think that might depress somebody who was from the 1980s looking at how computers have developed now. The internet would be an eye opener, no doubts about that, but they'd be worrying, wondering why people aren't programming them, getting them to do what they want them to do rather than just going out and downloading or buying a bit of software. Because primarily, you, most people from the sort of beginnings of the computer revolution would be learning how to code, learning what the machines did, learning what their limitations were, as well as obviously later on playing games and all this kind of thing because games initially weren't the big attraction to computers which sounds odd nowadays but the games were secondary the primary attraction was learning what you can do with it and i think that from the standpoint of a 1980s boy coming up to modern eras are going to just look at them and go what was the point we might as well have just carried on with the games machines. The, the Atari VCS has not involved them all the way through to the Xbox. Now, that's the bit where people who grew up around them, and especially the early machines, that's why they're looking a lot of the time to the past because they've realized there's, they're missing something. There's a big chunk missing you can no longer turn a machine on and start programming it. You have to go through bloatware and software and putting in a, loading up a, a, a language which would run inside of another bit of software. You're not directly communicating with the hardware anymore. And if you come from a, a, a background where you directly communicated with the hardware and that's where we're missing out and that's what a somebody from the 1980s will kind of think that we've all just got really lazy and we don't want to learn but I think a lot of it stems from the way the government got everybody interested in computer literacy and we became the UK became the most literate computer country in the world. And then it went to a version of um, computer users that they taught in school, how to use Windows, how to use word processor, how to use spreadsheet, how to use PowerPoint and so on, rather than teaching people how you can make the stuff, how to program them. And I think that would make somebody despair if they jumped from there till now from the 80s to now and skipped out that bit in the middle they wouldn't understand why we aren't writing everybody why isn't everybody writing their own software why can't any everyone code why can't people just design interfaces off that hang off the back of your machine to do various jobs and tasks so i think that's where we differ now. We are users, and we're not programmers. We are users, we're not innovators. We are users, we're not pioneers. And that's the whole pioneering spirit around them. We've lost it. 
We expect so much from our machines. We expect them to be all encompassing, ever useful. We expect them to do our online shopping, our ordering, our game, uh, our TV. We expect all of that. But we're losing out because one machine is like jack of all trades. You know, they're, they're actually master of none. We need to go back, I think, to having dedicated systems or machines or computers or equipment to do dedicated jobs because they're better, they're more stable. Kids and even adults won't sit in front of a computer now for hours on end inventing software, writing software. Whereas you would get children who sat in front of the ZX81, one of the cheapest, one of the cheapest computers imaginable, and start learning how to use it to invent programs, to invent even games. And they would spend days, weeks in front of it until it worked, until they got it right. And that teaches patience, discipline, and we don't have it now. Is that really the legacy of the invention of home computers or microcomputers? To create a society of want it nows, want it yesterday. The reason why we had these computers and we took to them so wholeheartedly in the early years was because they were new, they were different, they were being promoted. There was a lot of science fiction around them which people wanted to jump in on and find out what it was all about. There was standoffs between different people who supported different platforms. There was huge patriotism towards different machines. And, you know, it was healthy. It's got us to where we are today, but we had a bit in the middle where people kind of gave up on them. And that was before the internet came out and it became more interesting to have a computer because it was more useful to most people. And as soon as they get useful to most people, they lose their shine. So I hope it kind of makes sense. It was a lot longer than probably what you heard on here because it was, you could, I could have gone on forever about it because it's a subject that's close to many people's hearts, which is why there's a big retro scene around for the old 8-bit and 16-bit machines. And it seems to be even retro for people who weren't even there at the time. It is quite weird seeing uh, millennials basically talking about old machines, which, yeah, they, they know about them, but they didn't really know of them because they weren't there. But it's nice to see that people are looking back and f mostly for the right reasons. Thank you for listening.